They were moving around they were with the spirit. They were clapping and tam hitting the tambourines and, and the whole audience got into it. And the, and the funny part about it was the audience was segregated. The blacks were down front and the whites were in the back in a roped off area. You know, it was reverse, but now it was like that for us. And nobody said anything, nobody bothered anybody. But man, it, it was a great feeling. And I think Elvis picked up from that too. They do move around with those gospel singers. And I think Elvis had that rhythm to his body. And I think it, it was incorporated into in his stage performance. Memphis therefore gave Elvis an unparalleled opportunity for musical education. With its unique location at the tip of three states and on the Mississippi River, it drew various musical forms to its heart, and all of these would be influential on Presley's future output. What you had with Memphis music, what became what's known as Memphis music, is you had all these different influences. You had the jazz coming up the river boats from New Orleans, and those musicians would, you know, you, you docked here, and the musicians would get out and they would play and everything. So you had the jazz element there. You had the country music from the white farmers that were moving into Memphis and everything. You had the black music from the cotton pickers and everything coming into Memphis with the big uh, cotton center we had here. And you had the uh, the gospel from, we, we say Memphis is a city of churches, that we have more churches here than we have petrol stations. And I'm not sure that's true today, but at one time that was very true. You had church everywhere. And so you had music everywhere, you know, within the churches. And so you, all these things came together. Uh, it's almost impossible to, like me, have lived in Memphis all your life and not feel music in your body, not feel music in your system, in fact, you know. You can't take away from him that he was this, this musical sponge. And I think there was, there was a genius to him, that, that he just soaked this stuff in and he assimilated it. And what came out was undeniably him. As he developed in high school, Elvis became more confident and began to dress more flamboyantly. One clothing outlet that he was particularly drawn to was Lansky's. He would return to this shop well into the years of his global success, lured by the extravagance of the goods it sold. Lansky's uh, was, uh, it started out as a war surplus store. You go in and buy old army uniforms and things like that, you know. And then they decided they would go hip, and and uh, uh, Lansky's was uh, was dressing a lot of the black entertainers who had a a flair for you know the pinks and the blacks and the and the satins, and uh, but they were they were dressing a lot of the black entertainers who passed through here, uh, playing the club handy and everything. He was also the uh, haberdasher, if you will, of the pimps and say who, who liked their flash and their, their diamonds and everything as well. What Elvis would do in his own quiet way, everybody tries to make a statement in high school. Today the kids got tattoos and they got piercings and they got uh, different colored hair. Well, in those days, the way you stood out was you, you were an athlete or you were in high school politics. And I was in high school politics. I was president of senior class. I was editor of the yearbook, editor of the high school newspaper. But Elvis, uh, uh, then, then the athletic guys, you know, the, the athletes stood out and the cheerleaders and all that. But what Elvis would do, he would come to class. He'd been down on Bill Street, Lansky Brothers, obviously. And he'd picked up some clothing that entertainers normally wore. And he would wear that to school. He'd wear a, a black pair of pants with a white stripe down the side. Or he may wear uh, a, a black uh, sport coat with uh, trimmed in pink or something. So when he would walk down the hall, he would stand out like crazy. But that was his way of making a statement. Yes, we were all aware of what Elvis was doing with his clothing. Yet Elvis's new daring appearance extended to more than just his clothes. And with his slick hair and sideburns, he began to draw some negative attention. If you can imagine, in 1953, Elvis Presley's hair was longer than the Beatles' hair was in 64. And that was pretty strong back in those days because everybody in high school either had short hair or, or the athletes had a crew cut. And here comes Elvis with his long ducktail haircut and sideburns and his wild looking clothing. He stood out like a sore thumb. And yes, some of the guys gave Elvis a pretty hard time, but he took it good naturally. He was a good sport about it. And they appreciated that. One night he came to a school dance. I was taking up the tickets and he was walking down the hall and he had on this black outfit and pink socks. 
And Miss Richmond, our assistant principal, was looking down the hall and she kind of scrunched up and she said, who is that rogue? I said, I said, Miss Richmond, that's not a rogue, that's Elvis Presley, he's in our class. She says, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> In April 1953, Elvis's increasing self-confidence led him to sign up for the Humes High annual minstrel show, finally displaying his talents with a rendition of Till I Waltz Again With You, a Teresa Brewer hit from the previous year. I played clarinet in the band, and uh, the band used to put on a minstrel show uh, each year, and uh, uh, one year uh, I was one of the, the what they call an end men cracking the jokes, the, the black face and so forth. And uh, Elvis was uh, listed on the program as a uh, guitarist. They even misspelled his name. They spelled it uh, with a T, Presley. And uh, so he wasn't known at all then, but uh, I'll tell you this, the, the, the teenage girls still screamed and hollered when he sang. And uh, so you kind of knew he had something going, you know. Well, it was kind of difficult to hear him. The sound system in the auditorium was not all that great and a lot of noisy kids and so forth but he had a chair and he came out on the stage with a chair and he put his foot on the chair and he he, he sang that song about his dog that was a stage presence that's when everybody knew that he was good and he got a standing ovation i think and and everybody else after that was you know they could have just saved their time <laughs> On June the 3rd, 1953, Elvis graduated. Within two days, he was employed at a machinist shop, but he still had a driving ambition to be an entertainer. Later that summer, he stopped by at the Memphis Recording Service at 706 Union Street, with the knowledge that housed inside was the recently formed Sun Records, and that its owner, Sam Phillips, was seeking new talent. 